Good evening. On behalf of the faculty and staff at the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds in Dusseldorf, welcome, and thank you for listening to tonight's broadcast. My name is Lecter Finn J.D. John, Master Curator at the von Junst Library's Corvallis Branch. It is good to have you with us tonight. Tonight we will be reading Chapter 8 of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs the 1912 documentary of Mr. Burroughs' uncle, John Carter of Mars. But first, allow me to continue for our newer listeners to recount the fate of the Von Junts Library's Dusseldorf branch, the one that was left behind in the stream of time after the extratemporal library was preserved here. Last night I spoke of the small boy who crept inside the branch one night and was swept outside of time and of the desperate measures that had to be undertaken to return him to his family. More small boys soon came, all eager to repeat the experiment. One of those boys was a visitor from a faraway land, and he slipped into the library late at night when the moon was full in the company of two other young lads. The two other lads called this boy Justin. These children were more enterprising than most, and after a good rummage, one of them found the secret latch that opens up the storage vault, full of harmless old manuscripts, harmless and one that was not so harmless. The boys soon fell to reading the manuscripts in stentorian tones, letting the echoing stone vaults carry their voices in resonant ways so that they sounded like the gods of earth promulgating new legislation. And then one of the boys, the boy from the faraway land, laid his hand on a time-worn tome and opened it. Crikey, boys, it's wrote in English, he called to his mates. Listen to this. But as the boy started to read, it seemed his voice got deeper and louder, and suddenly the three boys looked at each other in fright. They realized that it was not only one boy reading the strange incantation. There was another voice, a deeper voice. So deep the very stones of the library trembled, and it spoke in perfect synchronicity with Justin. As the boys looked at one another in fright, one cried out, Stop reading it, Justin! But Justin could not stop. It was as if his mouth and his lungs were enchanted. He threw down the book, and yet his voice continued to chant the words from it as if he had them memorized. And although he understood them perfectly, he realized they were not in English after all. They were in something else, a language that he had never seen or heard in his short life, but that he somehow nonetheless knew. And then the boys heard the rush of great wings and a stream of giant bats burst out of the back of the room. And the three of them ran, ran as fast as they could run, racing down the front steps and out of the library, Justin still chanting the words that he could no longer see and could no longer understand but could not stop chanting. And then as the boys drew away from the library to a distance of about three hundred cubits, suddenly Euston felt something snap, and he felt silent, and the deep, resonant voice that had kept time so perfectly with his own broke out in a ragged scream that sounded of anguish and agony and breaking and dying, and a wind whirled down over their heads that tore patches of hair from their scalps, but did no other damage. And they saw a gray mass of angry chaos hurl down from the heavens and envelop the library. The three boys threw themselves down in the grass as bricks and stones and pieces of the library windows flew past them with whistles and shrieks. All the time that great demonic voice thundered, No! 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 And then all was still, and the sun was high in the sky, and they realized they had all fainted with fright, or with something else. And then they looked back at the library, and they saw that not one stone of it lay atop another. And now you know, listeners, why it is that it is not permitted that any reading or incantation of any kind be left unfinished in the library. It is now time to continue our reading of Edgar Rice Burroughs' account of the extraordinary experiences of his uncle, John Carter, on the planet Mars. Let us begin. Chapter 9. I Learn the Language As I came back to myself, I glanced at Sola, who had witnessed this encounter, and I was surprised to note a strange expression upon her usually expressionless countenance. What her thoughts were I did not know, 
for as yet I had learned but little of the Martian tongue, enough only to suffice for my daily needs. As I reached the doorway of our building, a strange surprise awaited me. A warrior approached, bearing the arms, ornaments, and full accoutrements of his kind. These he presented to me with a few unintelligible words and a bearing at once respectful and menacing. Later, Sola, with the aid of several of the other women, remodeled the trappings to fit my lesser proportions, and after they completed the work I went about garbed in all the panoply of war. From then on, Sola instructed me in the mysteries of the various weapons, and with the Martian young I spent several hours each day practicing upon the plaza. I was not yet proficient with all the weapons, but my great familiarity with similar earthly weapons made me an unusually apt pupil, and I progressed in a very satisfactory manner. The training of myself and the young Martians was conducted solely by the women, who not only attend to the education of the young in arts of individual defense and offense, but are also the artisans who produce every manufactured article wrought by the green Martians. They make the powder, the cartridge, and firearms. In fact, everything of value is produced by the females. In time of actual warfare, they form a part of the reserves, and when the necessity arises, fight with an even greater intelligence and ferocity than the men. The men are trained in the higher branches of the art of war, in strategy and the maneuvering of large bodies of troops. They make the laws as they are needed, a new law for each emergency. They are unfettered by precedent in the administration of justice. Customs have been handed down by ages of repetition, but the punishment for ignoring a custom is a matter for individual treatment by a jury of the culprit's peers, and I may say that justice seldom misses fire, but rather seems to rule in inverse ratio to the ascendancy of law. In one respect, at least, the Martians are a happy people. They have no lawyers. I did not see the prisoner again for several days subsequent to our first encounter, and then only to catch a fleeting glimpse of her as she was being conducted to the first audience chamber, where I had had my first meeting with Lorquas Potomel. I could not but note the unnecessary harshness and brutality with which her guards treated her, so different from the almost maternal kindliness which Sola manifested toward me, and the respectful attitude of the few green Martians who took the trouble to notice me at all. I had observed on the two occasions when I had seen her that the prisoner exchanged words with her guards, and this convinced me that they spoke, or at least could make themselves understood by, a common language. With this added incentive, I nearly drove Sola distracted by my importunities to hasten on my education, and within a few more days I had mastered the Martian tongue sufficiently well to enable me to carry on a passable conversation, and to fully understand practically all that I heard. At this time our sleeping quarters were occupied by three or four females and a couple of recently hatched young, besides Sola and her youthful ward, myself, and Woola the hound. After they had retired for the night, it was customary for the adults to carry on a desultory conversation for a short time before lapsing into sleep, and now that I could understand the language, I was always a keen listener, although I never proffered any remarks myself. On the night following the prisoner's visit to the audience chamber, the conversation finally fell upon this subject, and I was all ears on the instant. I had feared to question Sola relative to the beautiful captive, as I could not but recall the strange expression that I had noted upon her face after my first encounter with the prisoner. That it denoted jealousy I could not say, and yet, judging all things by the mundane standards as I still did, I felt it safer to affect indifference in the matter until I learned more surely Sola's attitude toward the object of my solicitude. Sarkoja, one of the older women who shared our domicile, had been present at the audience as one of the captive's guards, and it was toward her that the questioners turned. When, asked one of the women, will we enjoy the death throes of the Red One, or does Lorquas Potomal Jed in send holding her for ransom? They have decided to carry her back with us to Thark and exhibit her last agonies at the great games before Tal Hodges, replied Sarkoja. What will be the manner of her going out, inquired Sola. She is very small and very beautiful. I had hoped that they would hold her for ransom. Sarkoja and the other women grunted angrily at this evidence of weakness on the part of Sola. It is sad, Sola, that you were not born a million years ago, snapped Sarkoja, when the, all the hollows of the land were filled with water and the people were as soft as the stuff they sailed upon. In our day we have progressed to a point where such sentiments mark weakness and atavism. It will not be well for you to permit Tars Tarkas to learn that you hold such degenerate sentiments, as I doubt that he would care to entrust such as you with the grave responsibilities of maternity. I see nothing wrong with my expression of interest in this red woman, retorted Sola. 
She has never harmed us, nor would she, should we have fallen into her hands. It is only the men of her kind who war upon us, and I have ever thought that their attitude toward us is but a reflection of ours toward them. They live at peace with all their fellows, except when duty calls upon them to make war, while we are at peace with none, forever warring among our own kind as well as upon the red men, and even in our own communities the individuals fight among themselves. Oh, it is one continual awful period of bloodshed, from the time we break the shell until we gladly embrace the bosom of the river of mystery, the dark and ancient is which carries us to an unknown but at least no more frightful and terrible existence. Fortunate indeed is he who meets his end in an early death. Say what you please to Tars Tarkas, he can mete out no worse fate to me than a continuation of the horrible existence we are forced to lead in this life. This wild outburst on the part of Sola so greatly surprised and shocked the other women that, after a few words of general reprimand, they all lapsed into silence and were soon asleep. One thing the episode had accomplished was to assure me of Sola's friendliness toward the poor girl, and also to convince me that I had been extremely fortunate in falling into her hands rather than those of some of the other females. I knew that she was fond of me, and now that I had discovered that she hated cruelty and barbarity, I was confident that I could depend upon her to aid me and the girl captive to escape, provided, of course, that such a thing was within the range of possibilities. I did not even know that there were any better conditions to escape to but I was more than willing to take my chances among people fashioned after my own mold rather than to remain longer among the hideous and bloodthirsty green men of Mars. But where to go and how was as much of a puzzle to me as the age-old search for the spring of eternal life has been to earthly men since the beginning of time. I decided that at the first opportunity I would take Sola into my confidence and openly ask her to aid me, and with this resolution strong upon me I turned among my silks and furs, and slept the dreamless and refreshing sleep of Mars. That's all we have time for tonight, listeners. This broadcast is a production of the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds with branches in Dusseldorf, Stregoi Kavar, and Corvallis. To learn more about our extratemporal institution of forgotten learning, please turn to our hub page at von-junst.org. Or, if you prefer to visit in person, Simply come to Dusseldorf on a clear, moonless night, rent or purchase a small skiff, and silently paddle north on the Rhine until you see the great stone tower rising from its eastern banks. Before I sign off, perhaps I should explain something, lest you think I lie or exaggerate. You may have noticed that I had a good deal of what you might call inside information on the experience of the small boy from a faraway land whose interrupted incantation caused the destruction of the library that moonlit night so long ago. Perhaps you wondered how I might know those things. In reply, I would simply like to reveal that the J in my name stands for Euston. Thank you once again, listeners. Good night, and as always, I wish you productive.